Hi, and welcome to Reinventing the Classroom, a brand new conference that we are so excited about. And Howie, you must have been excited because you submitted four sessions of which you can only accept two. <laughs> I, I, hey, I just saw that, Steve, and I said, wow, this is going to really be cool. Right up your alley. Yeah. Thanks to thanks to Classflow for supporting this event, making it free, and thanks to Blackboard Collaborate for the terrific platform. So there are some of you in the live audience. To indicate where you're participating from, look to the left of the map. You're looking for some icons. The star icon is the second one down. If you click on it twice and then click on the map, you can indicate visually your location. Or you can put a note in the chat and let us know where you're participating from. If you're listening to the recording, thank you for taking the time to do so. Howie, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate this opportunity. Really excited about it when you uh, sent the info out. And we're going to, uh, it's going to be quick. Um, the first thing that I kind of would like to establish with everybody, there are a number of slides that are in here. I'll tell you where you get a full copy of either a PDF or a PowerPoint. But uh, what I'd like to kind of tell everybody that uh, take one thing away today. Find one thing that you can do. Um, and the session basically revolves around um, how can we create uh, the new innovators, the, the new folks that are going to kind of lead our country in innovation and new companies and so on. So you can see the uh, Twitter ID on there is H. de Blasi. If you'd like to follow, I do eight to ten tweets a day. Uh, for example, this morning I tweeted just before we came on here some information about Google X, what that's all about, how the innovative secret lab is out there. Also did a tweet about 100 open source uh, uh, replacements for security tools. And that also gave you a list of uh, e-learning authoring tools. So I do five to ten of those a day. You want to jump on Twitter. Uh, Howie at Frontier.net is the email. And DrHowie.com is uh, the web address. And my background, just real quick, the 30-second version is I was a classroom teacher for 20 years, uh, left education, ran a computer business, and owned that business for 10 years. And then I was in Durango, Colorado for 17 years as their chief information officer. Now I get to travel around, live the world, and share my passion for 21st century uh, technology and, and tech. So it's a, a great uh, retirement piece to have uh, where I get to do and share my passions for all of these these things that are on there. Uh, we did one last week. I was looking to see if Peggy was in here. Peggy uh, put a comment and that I thought was uh, very flattering for, for me anyway. And said, so Peggy George Howie is the only one that I know who can give Adam Bellow a run for his money on a number of slides and related commentary in a short time. Incredible. So that's what you will get. You will see a lot of information as we go through each one of these. Uh, the website, the links are there now. DrHowie.com, and at the very top, um, it does say uh, for the conference information. And then this session, there are two downloads. One is the PDF, one is the PowerPoint. Everything licensed under Creative Commons, so you're more than free to use that in any way that you'd like to. Information you'd like to have on there, share with others, just give uh, credit. And uh, share and share alike is the attribute that, that happens to be on there. Uh, the Disney Science one I'm going to talk about a little bit. It's an unofficial site that's uh, not officially out there, waiting for some final uh, permissions with some folks at Disney that I'm working with. Uh, and as I said, the emails on there and I'll also give you the Dr. Howie website at the end. Magazine that I read uh, every week, uh, Edutopia, it used to be free. It now is a cost, uh, about $33 a year. Fantastic magazine about uh, innovation, creativity, changes in education, People that are change agents, and especially what I really enjoy is the videos that they put on there of schools. They're not just talking about it, but they're actually doing it. So it's really great to see that magazine. Uh, yesterday, uh, one of the things, I get, I get some uh, information every day in my email. And ironically, here was the, t the topic for the day about teaching innovation. And there's three different links uh, on these slides when you download them. Uh, the colors that you see on there, you will even see the link or in a deep blue, purple color, those are hot links. So when you download either the PDF or the PowerPoint, you'll be able to go directly to those websites. The two magazines that I read on the business side are Fast Company and Wired. Fast Company keeps me abreast of innovation uh, companies and what they're doing, where they're moving, the direction that they're going. And Wired Magazine is kind of the geeky magazine about all the things technology-wise 
a little uh, higher geeky level that's in there, so I subscribe to those two. Uh, this is a book I came across that uh, Steve Alcorn, a Disney Imagineer that I work with, shared with me. It's called Thinker Toy. Great exercises and a business, but um, it, it then has activities in there with the little book in there that you can do in the classroom. Great, great tool for innovation and creativity that's in there. And then these are some Disney books. I uh, do some part-time work with Disney. I'll share about that in a few minutes. And these are uh, some workbooks they have. The most fascinating one to me was called The Imagineering Way. And that is the philosophical piece behind Disney. But the Imagineering Workout are exercises that you can do each day. There's over 100 of them that are in there that you can use in the classroom uh, if you'd like to. So this uh, slide is my warning slide that you're going to get a lot of information as we go through this. So as I said at the beginning, find one or two things that you can use. Don't worry about trying to write a lot of things down. Um, it will be in each one of the slides. The links are in there. You can download the PDF or the PowerPoint, and you'll have all the links and all the information. And the second part of that warning is the slides are busy. I'm, I'm aware of that. I was uh, in uh, Vicki Davis's session last night, and I really felt okay now because Vicki has a lot of information. We try to put it on the slide, so if you want that one slide to use it, it's there for you. So these are the things very quickly that I'm going to go through, and if we don't get through all of them, you'll have the PowerPoint or PDF to take a look at as we go through each one of these. Um, Steve, this will uh, be near and dear to your heart. Um, I met Steve a number of years ago when I found the Classroom 2 website. I share this in every presentation that I do, and it's just amazing the information that I can find in there, and especially under the forums and the groups. And what I've shared with a lot of people is that you can go in there, and if you're looking for a cell phone policy, you can go into the group. Somebody's already done it, and they're willing to share it in there. Steve, I don't know if that number is correct, but uh, I'll update it. You can send me uh, a tweet if you want, and I'll get the correct one in there. Lots of great information, so no matter if it's Common Core you're looking at or uh, things about Twitter. Second one for information resource is Curriki, and all you do is type in there what you want, creativity, innovation, problem solving, and you can see it can be done by grade level if you want and content area to look all those things up. This is a, a magazine, another one, uh, it's called Creative Boom, and I put this in here because it covers many, many things in the arts area, and by that I mean the creative areas, and examples of videos and media that's being used. And one of those things that we're going to do uh, that I want you to see is uh, Amy's going to show you a very short video, and this was an ad um, in a second here, we're going to run it, but it's an ad that was done locally for Disneyland, and it was basically about a new attraction. And it was designed only for people in the Anaheim and Southern California area. But the question was, how do the Imagineers put together an advertisement to get people to come to the park to see a new traction? This thing went viral. And this is about 2012 when this was happening that was on there. And it's called Darth Vader Goes to Disneyland. So I'll let Amy go ahead and cue that video and go ahead and play that. Assuming all will work good. okay. So if the video doesn't automatically start, go ahead and press play. And if you don't see that, um, you can click the link in the chat. So that, as I said, went viral, and um, I talked to a few folks that put that together, and everything you want to do for a challenge for kids, show that to them, because it is extremely creative in an ad campaign uh, and, and what it does. 
So we're going to move on to the next one now, and this is uh, a little information about the Walt Disney Company and what happened in that particular ad campaign. And uh, this was a young lady at Ken that told me this and said this to me, and uh, this is kind of my motto as, uh, for the last six years of traveling around the world, that I'm just one person, but, you know, I can really make a difference, and hopefully you'll take away some ideas today to uh, see each one of these. And I always start a session or a workshop or a conference, presentation, or working with school districts with this question, because a lot of people don't know what they don't know. And what I do is put a series of questions up. So through those series of questions, you can kind of do a self-evaluation uh, uh, and say, well, do I know this? Do I know this? So I put these questions up here. This is what I would take you through at the beginning of the session, whether you were a classroom teacher, a librarian, media specialist, administrator, technology coordinator, whatever it happened to be. And that will help me then frame my workshop and what I'm putting together. So through that, when we introduced this, I did some research and said, well, what do kids want to be when they grow up? And these were the top things that they came up with. Um, and it, you can see some of these are not realistic. But what's interesting is these two individuals that said when they grow up, seven years old, Danielle said she wants to be a model and she's going to get $505 a year. Francisco, he's got it figured out. He's going to be a spy or a superhero, and he's going to, work, he's going to earn $500,000 a year. So Francisco's got it all figured out of, of what he actually wants to do. So in the last um, couple of years, especially since he, when uh, Steve Jobs had passed away, there was a lot of things on books and movies and things that came out. Um, and there's some research that's saying that kids want to be the next Steve Jobs. So the question comes about is, well, how are we going to do that? How are we going to prepare our kids in the classroom and then still try to meet Common Core and all the other initiatives that are out there and the testing and the assessment pieces that are all out there? Uh, and then it's usually one of the kickbacks that I get a lot of times is, you want me to do what? How am I supposed to do that? All of the things that I'm going to share with you this morning are things that you can do that are very simple and easy and start with a small piece and you work up to larger ones. So these were some pieces that I shared with the group that we have a discussion on and see if you fall into any one of those characteristics uh, of the highly creative people and those are the habits. Kind of you've seen all the habit things that Steve and Covey and others did. These were the habits that uh, people have that are very creative. And then I listed these individuals that are on here. And you'll notice that there's a wide range of people that are in there. And these were mostly business and entertainment. Uh, Steve, and these are not necessarily in order of popularity or business or money. These were all different people. And notice it went all the way back from Thomas Edison to Steve Jobs and therefore in between all of those. Here's a company uh, made by uh, Jack Dempsey. Jack, Jack Dempsey is the gentleman that started Twitter. And he has a company now called Square where you can take credit card. And what Jack did is he reinvented the credit card business and the mobile payment, which you can walk into in many places that you now just put your phone up there. Jack was the one that came up with a $275 a month flat fee. And they also figured out how to connect with 7,000 Starbucks locations. And he processes just from Starbucks $10 billion worth of transactions annually. So he's figured that out. So let's take a look at a couple of things on the why, and then I want to show you the how. Now, I'm going to, uh, this is, uh, Amy Rosen um, does a career tech ed uh, program, and she made this statement at a conference recently that we should have an entrepreneurship in class at all of our career tech ed schools. What's interesting to note here is a lot of schools are looking at that, uh, calling it by different names of what they do, the best model that I know of in the country is Blue Valley School Districts. Uh, Donna Deeds was uh, the curriculum director when I was at Durango. Donna moved on several years ago to Blue Valley School District and runs the CAPS program. Take a look at what it has because it's absolutely amazing. 240 partnerships with every major corporation in Overland, Kansas, in the Kansas City area. They have a bioscience strand, an engineering strand, business and technology, and human services. And again, don't panic because of all the information on there. You'll be able to click in any one of those and be able to look at it in detail. I just want to give kind of a shout out to, uh, to that school and what they're doing. So I put five reasons together um, and what these are. And I'm going to quickly go through them because I want to get really right into the how piece so that you see what a lot of those are. 
And what we need to do is come up with new ideas, new designs, new pieces that will go together. And in that classroom, how do we encourage and enable innovation in the students? What are projects and things that we can do? And I have several of those to show that you can do as a full classroom project, a day, an hour, a week, a month if you want to. So we'll be showing you some of those things. And then um, this was a quote that was given that uh, Alexander gave to me that he sent to me through an email, and, and he said, an open-minded inquiry society encourages and supports its learning innovators. And then he says, a closed-mind society shuts them down. And if we look at the models that we have now in most of our schools, that we don't have an inquiring uh, innovation, innovative classroom. And then this was a quote that was given by President Obama, and it was basically an initiative for STEM and STEAM. And I'm going to cover a few things in that area. And what I'd like to do now in the, in the folks that are in the, uh, in the session is <clears throat> excuse me, to type in uh, the chat box some things that you're doing that are innovative. And uh, I gave Amy a heads up at the beginning that her and I would be having a little conversation. So, Amy, at the school that you're currently at, um, could you tell us something that maybe that's going on that's innovative? And a lot of times you may not think it's innovative, but other people will go, wow, I didn't know they'd do that. So anything you'd like to share? Sure. So I am a librarian at a very small liberal arts college in Western North Carolina. And uh, one of our latest things is we have um, developed a tech lab. So one of the librarians is also the sort of tech go-to on campus. Um, we we have a 3D printer, and we are printing all of the time. So, um, for example, some one of the faculty members broke their arm uh, last last month, and we printed a bone a bone replica for him. Um, we are printing pieces for the blacksmith crew to uh, to make different various things. Um, we're printing all kinds of stuff, and the tech lab does all kinds of really fun things. They've got a they've got a remote control airplane that they've hooked up a a um, satellite and GPS reader to, and so we are. Uh, virtually mapping the whole area of wow. the school. It's very fun. So uh, basically we just get to play all the time I was, with, with all kinds of new excellent. schools. I was just reading. I'm just cracking up because Mrs. Howard just put in there. I don't know if you saw what she said. She says, I'm watching this presentation on innovation. Guess what? Kids are taking a state test. <laughs> That's exact. Okay. Let's not get on that bandwagon. Let's keep going here. So I'm going to put some things up here on creativity, and I've added some quotes, and again, Creative Commons, it's licensed, so you can take individual slides out, just give credit where credit is due. So you'll see several of these as we go through it. And I thought I really enjoyed this one that Maya gave me about you can't use it up. And the more you use, the more you get, the more things that you do to put it in there. And one of the most that I have found just unbelievable resources out is on Pinterest. My wife introduced me to this. I said, you know, I would never do it. All you have to do is type creativity, and I did a workshop at uh, – at Q and uh, uh, also at METC in St. Louis on uh, the last few weeks. And one of the things we did was on superheroes. So I typed Pinterest, creativity, superheroes. Amazing things that came up, ideas I never would have thought about. And here's a, a link also of how to prepare the innovators and things that are going on in the classroom today. And it's an article about how you can turn them into an idea factory. And again, the links, as you see, that are right here are listed right there of what those are, and you can go directly to those. So when we come up with these ideas, one of the things we need to do in the classroom is make sure that uh, the knowledge that we're gaining is that we can apply it. So as we go through and look at some of these, and again, this is an article direct link to it about creativity at work and how that works. And I want to just take a few minutes to talk about how all of these pieces in inquiry-based learning, project-based learning, STEM, STEAM, uh, how it works. And this is kind of the end result. Not starting, I wouldn't suggest you start with this. This is after you've taken the baby steps and gone through that. And by going, excuse me, through each one of those, one of the things that we really have to do is make sure that we prepare our educators in professional learning or professional development. And one of those, uh, one of the most popular courses that I teach, either at conferences or within districts, is this one that I'm going to refer to, and it's all tied to project-based learning. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with that. You know what those stages are, how we go through it. 
The very last one that you see on there is, I think, one of the most important, the public audience. And I'll talk about that in just a minute of how we do it in our, our Disney class. I put some uh, uh, things in here. Sometimes you have to go to the board to do some of these things. And whenever you see uh, IBL, that's inquiry-based learning or project-based learning, or sometimes referred to as problem-based learning. So I've listed all these on here. So if you need a slide to go with the board that's on there, I'm not going to take time on each one of these to go through again because I want to give you examples. But you've got it all there. I did uh, a workshop at Q. And one of the things that we made sure, and also at FETC, we did a three-hour workshop on this on STEM and STEAM, is that you understand the difference that, uh, between the projects and the project-based learning. And the project itself is the learning. It's not the dessert. It's not the end thing you do. You go through all the knowledge piece, and then that you're going to teach through that project. And one of those ways that we've actually done that is starting small. Now, I'm going to show you the end result, and then I'm going to work backwards. So most people start too big and they get frustrated because it does take a lot of hard work in putting those pieces together. So I suggest you start small and you'll see my sample here of this program that we've done. And it's basically design and theme park attraction uh, for a Disney World park. And what we do with the project-based learning, again, this is another slide. I've listed some of the things that you can use to share with different people. And what you have to do is figure out what information you know, and it's back to the I don't know what I don't know. What do you know about the parks? Where are they located? What kind of attractions? What's the difference between an amusement park and a theme park? And putting all those different pieces together. And one of those things that I start in the conversation if we were doing this as an all-day workshop is I would say compare and contrast Walt Disney World to Kennedy Space Center, Universal Studios to Atlanta Sea Aquarium and to SeaWorld, Dinner Theater to Cirque du Soleil. And the idea of that is to make sure that you cannot Google it. Put a compare and contrast up there. So what is the difference between those? So you have to do some research on it to find that, and then get up in front of the group and make a presentation. So that's a little compare and contrast exercise that I do. And that can be done in any number of things. So I'm going to jump into, this is, uh, these are different pieces. And Tony Wagner uh, sent some of these things to me, so I've kind of from uh, a piece that he put together out of his new book before he pre-released it. I was uh, given a copy of some of it, and I thought it was really interesting of taking uh, how what schools don't do is they try to do uh, everything as single academic discipline. But in project-based learning and in STEM, that's not what we do. It's all woven together, hands-on, creating the projects. So what we have to do, this is the title, and if you will uh, send to me later today an email, I will send you, uh, we anticipate publishing uh, September 4th. Uh, there is a 196-page PDF manual that is available to you to use, and you can do it in a single day, a week, a month, and everything is in that book. Uh, and it will be free to each of you that send me an email, howie at frontier.net. I will send you the link where you can download that on the Disney Science website. So here's what the building blocks are. They're in that manual of the phases that we take the students through. Now, we, I train the teachers, and they in turn go back and teach the class. So with that information that's in there of those building blocks, that's what it is all modeled around. And then what we do is there's 10 steps that we actually go through. We put a team together, and that team consists, you'll see, uh, of several people in it. We work in groups of usually two or three in a classroom, and it, it, began, it ends up becoming a competition. So we go through the team. The blue sky for the Disney term used is what are we going to build? How are we going to build it? What's the story behind it? What's the theme behind it? Where's the research that's been done on this? What about the patents that are out there? Do we own the patent? Will we have to create a new patent? How about design, building, architects, models, testing it, the engineering piece, the what they call audio animatronics, the special effects, and then the summative assessment, and the most important piece is the presentation. And what I do, um, I have several friends that are either Imagineers, former Imagineers, uh, and Disney authors, and we bring them in via a video conference, and they are the assessment group. They are presenting them to an authentic audience. And you talk about kids getting engaged, and even the teachers, it's pretty amazing watching what happens. These are the jobs, and sometimes people take on duplicates. 
but she was a creative project director that's in charge of the whole thing. A geek, we need a researcher. You can see all the listings that are there, and those jobs, um, you actually compete for those. You apply for those. You have to go through. We select the creative project director, and then you decide who's going to be on your team. Um, you have to do some sketching. You have to come up with concept art to kind of sell what this is to the group of what you're going to put together. Here's some things uh, of Walt Disney did what he called pitching, telling the story. And this is what it's going to do. Here's where we're going to go. Here's what we're going to say. Here's how it's going to happen. Um, I have some connections at Pixar, so I, they sent me this photo of how they're doing a storyboard for, uh, this is like a cars when the movie first came out. You can see all the three by five cards in putting those pieces together, connect it down to a computer now to put all those pieces together. We go into the patent research. Amazing what Google has of every patent that's out there. And in the lower left, that happens to be, if you've ever been on Star Tours, that is the patent for that. Upper right, that is the uh, new um, uh, device that floats on air at um, Mater's Jamboree. And uh, it's kind of based on an attraction that was done back in the late 50s at Disneyland. And that's the original uh, patent that was applied. We do research on audio animatronics. How do they make those things talk? How do they make them real? How do they program? And then you have to pitch your presentation so the group agrees on what's going to be done. And here's some students. And you have to actually make a model of your attraction. In this case, these students were all doing coasters uh, and put that together. And then they have to do a pitch at the end of it for the assessment piece. So the uh, next few slides, I'm going to show you what happened actually um, at the presentation piece. And I, this is one that they use if you don't know about it. Live slide is absolutely amazing that you can use any device so everybody can connect. And we do this in the conference where we use live slides. And you can, I can upload it. You all can go in there. And then you can annotate it on any one of the slides and put notes. So you could use it in a school board meeting, in a classroom, any number of ways that you can do that. So and that's, here's a particular piece uh, that I put on here that somebody was doing on the Civil War, putting those together. And you can go draw on that, put arrows to it, and annotate that through a smartphone, a computer, any number of ways of putting those together. And David sent me uh, about a month ago this. So if you don't have any presentation tools, there are 40 of them listed there that David has been kind enough. And again, don't worry about trying to write this link down. When you get the slide, you'll be able to click on it and pull all those pieces together. This was at METC in St. Louis here last month. And this was, uh, they decided to call themselves the D23 team. And you can see they have a map of the park. They're trying to decide where it's going to go, putting the uh, pieces together, doing the research. Uh, this particular one in the front was amazing because they went in the trash and they found a box and then they made a ride vehicle out of this. Now to take it to the next level for their presentation, they then made a, and, and there's no guidance really in this whatsoever, it's entirely up to the group. They made a stop motion video. They went and borrowed chairs from the conference center, put a tablecloth over the top in the bottom photo, and then did stop motion animation of the attraction as it went through here. Um, they took it to a level that I've never seen. We've done about 50 of these workshops, and it was amazing to see what those folks did. So I'm going to give you now in the next uh, 15 minutes or so, 20 minutes, and then we'll leave some time at the end for questions. Uh, I'm going to give you lots of simple things to do. So in the chat box, what I'm going to do, and I'm going to ask Amy and just uh, have her answer some of these. In the chat box, what I would like you to do is type uses for a paper clip. Now, I put a few things that are up here. So anything that you can think of that's not up here. So Amy, I'm going to let you jump back in here. And give us some uses for a paper clip. Now, I've got some up there, but again, you can't use those. So go ahead and go for it. And if, you, if you're blank, it's OK. OK, the first thing that came to mind is picking a lock. I don't know what that says about me, but that was my <laughs> first inclination. <laughs> OK. And we'll just watch as other people put them in there. You will try another one, and then we'll switch it over to Steve and see if uh, Steve can, oh, Steve's away. Steve went helping in another room. So you got another one? Um, let me let me think about it. Let's see. We've got okay. wire holders, mini magnet holders. That's good. Um, I I could imagine using it to clean uh, clean in between things uh, in between tight spaces. 
I'm, look, I'm watching kind of, and you can also use it for ejecting things. Uh, the old the, on most of your CD or DVD, not in DVD so much anymore, but uh, the old CD, if you can push it in and eject, you can reset on a router uh, to put that piece in there. So we'll let them keep putting things in there. But if you want to know, there's 101 uses. Now I don't know how subtle you see it, but did you notice how creative I got in the colors, Amy, of putting the answer up there? So we'll go on to the next one, and Very the, question, good. the question comes up is, can I really learn to be creative? That's something you're born with, and I, I really don't believe that. Um, I, I was very fortunate to come from a uh, family, and my grandfather immigrated from Italy and had a shop and a basement and always making things. Um, and these are some notes that I put together uh, along with a blog, and I do a lot of these things. There is a notepad right next to my bed. There are times at 2.30 in the morning, I'm awake and I'm thinking, oh, I could, I, oh, what about, and I'll jot those down and go back to sleep. So I wrote several things down here of things that you can do that you can learn to be creative and uh, some helps on there. So again, a couple of these slides, I'm going to jump quickly through. Um, here's another one that uh, was sent to me. And Christina sent this to me, and it was about Leonardo da Vinci. And uh, we've been to Italy several times, and there's a museum there. It's just fantastic. It's got many of the things from the 14th and 15th century uh, that were developed and built that are actually there in the museum. So these are the things that are in there about that. And then what she has is examples. Now, I'm trying still, and Amy, I'll ask you, do you have any idea what that thing is in the bottom left? That just looks really nasty to me. That does look really nasty. <laughs> uh, it looks like some sort of a, a combination of a medieval torture device and uh, oil oil rig <laughs> and ship. Yeah, I, that, I'm not sure what it is, but Leonardo did that. It's a model that they built, and there's a whole bunch of things that she has in there creativ uh, for creativity, and it's really, really excellent. So I then added on this over the last uh, six months or so as I've been doing this session around the country uh, with, with school districts, and I added six websites that you can have to click on and go explore on your own. And again, don't panic. I know you're seeing a lot of information. Just uh, at the end, you can download this and go to each one of these and take a look at those. Best way, now this, uh, everything I have in here is free unless I tell you otherwise. Glockster has been around for a number of years. Glockster is the most creative piece that's out there. It allows you to make a presentation. And as you can see, you can put text and images and videos. And you put all those pieces on there to do the presentation. So I'm not a big fan of writing and turning it into a teacher. Uh, in other words, that's an audience of one. What we want is an audience of many. And by publishing this in the Glockster EDU, there is a public Glockster, but this is the EDU. It is free for 30 days, and you can have uh, about 10 blogs. And there is a cost, but I give you a hint. If you do it during the summer, it is about a fourth of the price, and you can get it for all of your kids. So there is a cost associated, but you can get it for 30 days for free. Absolutely amazing. Here's one that somebody did on uh, Picasso. And, um, the artwork that he did and put it together. It is very interactive. You click on things, you can put videos and YouTube things that are in there. Second one that's uh, a way to do this here is Sketchpad. Many, many different ways and colors. Very powerful uh, things that you can add. It is collaborative that we can share on it. We can have 12 people at a time on it. And then the next one that's on here is kind of my favorite. It's called Scribblink. Very similar to the others. But what it allows me to do is be collaborative with 15 people. But notice in the upper left-hand corner, it's got a lot of math functions. So we could put a math problem up there, and we could share with a classroom next door, or actually I could do with a class in California or in another country if we wanted to. So that's available. Pixton's been around for a number of years, being able to uh, creatively write comic books to tell a story, to put all those pieces together. And again, the link is there, and all you can do. Uh, I, I'm just amazed at what I watch younger kids, and by that I mean fourth and fifth graders put together on these, and direct links are there for each one of those. And then I added uh, the link here also for Printerist and some of the things that are available for you on that. So I'm going to move into the problem solving, creating a product and so on, and putting this piece together and some ideas that we can put in here. And what these are, um, I have a series of these. CSI has been very, very popular for years. 
And what I put together is about six slides here of different ones. This is a combination of Rice University with the CSI experiment. And what you do is there's now six of these. That screenshot that's on the right there, it says only five. Uh, case five is under development. Then now the sixth one and the fifth one are done. And you go through, you have to go through a series of rookie trainings. Um, you can do this as small groups. You can do it on a projector with a teacher in front of the class, meeting small groups. Any number of those, and the direct link is there that Rice University has partnered with uh, CBS to do that. Uh, the next one from the Smithsonian Channel is Foresnik First. Now, I do need to tell you on this one, this is probably not appropriate for elementary school. And that's why I have that kind of highlighted at the beginning. It is appropriate, probably. Middle school kids absolutely love this website. It is very gruesome. But in order to show what has happened of a person, excuse me, that has been murdered, uh, and then you have to start that investigation through the Foresnicks. Uh, and so it's probably appropriate more for high school, but middle school kids, you know, if you've taught that, I did that for several years, they seem to like the gory things that are in there. That's called Foresnick First. Direct link is there. Um, the uh, Foresnick Chemistry piece is there with True TV. That's another link. And then this is the part uh, on the Fresnik first, the tools that you can go through. You are the medical examiner. You have to go, and this is where it gets pretty gruesome, because they actually do an autopsy. So very, very uh, uh, excellent site. This one I added uh, last month. Uh, I was sharing this in uh, Q in California. And people were talking about, well, how can I use a game in my classroom? So I'm going to give you an idea of what you can put together on this and how much fun it can be. I don't know if there's anybody out there that has not played Angry Birds, but I have some screenshots there so you can kind of see what it is. And I thought, I wonder what it would be like if we could somehow make a creative project and put Angry Birds together. So what I wanted to do was the thought behind it of exploring machines and simple machines, because basically that's what's happening when you launch. And depending on the angle and the propulsion and velocity, you have to knock these different structures down. So what we want to try to do is start out with, I don't know what I don't know. So my question is, and I would go through the group, and again, we don't have time, I apologize, but I would ask you, what are the six simple machines? Now, if you want to drop that in the, in the, uh, the uh, chat box, you can. And I sent Amy a $100 bill, and somebody that gets all six of them, Amy, you will send that to them, right? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we'll go on to the next one of the six. And then I do need to warn you, this is the most fun you will have. Your kids will go home and talk to their parents when they say, what did you do today? Mom, you won't believe it. Marshmallows were flying through the air in the classroom. Because you do want to control the environment, you want the students to learn, but you want to have a lot of fun. And what you do is you throw a bunch of things on the table. This is just some examples that I put together. Um, and the uh, your popsicle sticks, rubber band straws, popcorn, marshmallows, ping pong balls, any number of things. That's entirely up to you what you put together. And by the way, um, this was sent to me by someone, and I forgot to put their link in there. I will add that later to that. So what you do is pose the problem. You say, somebody go through all around the city. We can't get in. We need to get food over there, however you want to build that up. You need to design a device that will get that over. If you want to make it more complicated, tell them there's water outside of it, and you've got to figure a way to float it there to do it. Amy, that's why the nasty-looking thing that I showed, maybe that's a device that you could use to, to get over there. Um, moving objects. So what are we going to use? Popcorn, marshmallows, put them over a fence, and then how are we going to actually use that structure in there to make a slingshot contraption? And what they have to do you can use SketchUp, you can actually build it. There's any number of ways, depending on the resources that you have. And this is where the engineering, the creativity, the innovation comes in. It's amazing watching what kids do. Some, just with a simple fulcrum, where they put something down, uh, a piece of material, and use a popsicle stick to throw it over. Others add rubber bands and things to it. Then what we do is when we go through, the, I don't know what I don't know, is we explore the six machines and give them different ideas, then let them come back and do it. And we do a lot of what if. And what you want to do is take measurements. Well, if I do this, it goes this far, or it goes this high. Let's make a prediction. What would happen if this went to this point? Or how do I get it to go further? How do I get it to go higher? And as I said, um, it's amazing. It's so much fun doing this. But again, take a concept of a game, 
come up with an idea to put that piece together and to put it and have a lot of fun with it. And guess what? The kids are really learning a lot of things in the process. So this is one that uh, I have a session that I do actually all on failure, and it's called A Safe Place to Fail. And it has to do a lot with adaptability. And what I'm trying to get across in this is most of our classrooms around the country are in an environment that is success, success, praise, success. And the way that I always start that session, I'll share it with you, is the real world out there, everyone does not get a trophy. And it just really bothers me a lot that there's so much positive encouragement that we don't want our kids to fail. But we can do that in a safe environment. And it's easy to do with a number of things. And we, we, uh, we don't have classes that actually let you try this and learn from that. There's no real innovation if we don't have that. So what I want to do is give you some ideas and some things that you can do. Um, Vicki didn't share this video, but uh, I follow her on Twitter, and she sent this to me about failure, and I have uh, the link is at the bottom there. It is so powerful that uh, Vicki put this on here, and it's about how little babies fail and fail and learn and fail. And then what it does is it morphs into uh, people that were recently at the Winter Olympics and how many times they failed to get that gold medal. And it's really a great video. It's a two-minute video, really well done. So take a look at that and, uh, and see what uh, it talks about on failure. So I have several quotes in here, again, for you to use for your presentation, for your superintendent, for your curriculum director. But what we want to do is how do we gain that self-confidence? And there's a video, and I have the link that's on the bottom here of Famous Failures. And you've probably seen this at one point in time, but I put it on there because I think it's really a great piece uh, to take a look at of how people like Michael Jordan, uh, Steve Jobs, Walt Disney, and it basically says if you've never failed, you've never tried. So here's, uh, I didn't put all of them there, but uh, people that have been successful. And what I really like about each one of these links, it tells in a short paragraph about their failure and how many times they failed in order to have success and what they learned from that. So we need to have that environment that's on there. And one of those ways that we can do that is games. And when I say games, I'm referring to, there are a lot of different things out there. I'm going to talk about Amanita. And the reason I do is, this is a group from Czechoslovakia. My wife and I did uh, a tour of Prague and Budapest doing some work um, this uh, past December. And uh, meeting with these folks, it's pretty amazing what they're doing. And one of the things that's, that's really amazing is the way that they design these games. There are no instructions, none. So you don't have a clue what to even do. It's a lot of discovery, a lot of failure. What would happen if I did this? Being curious. Oh, well, maybe let me try that. Let's see what would happen if we went here. And I have these direct links on here that you can actually play the game. Graphics are unbelievable in high resolution of what they do. The Quest for the Rest, direct link to it. Now, there is a free version on these, and then there is a purchase version. The only difference is the free version has two or three levels which is probably more than enough for one classroom period. And then the purchase version, um, they are uh, like 15 or 20 levels that are on there. So all of those are on there. And that's the way this game starts. And you have no clue. You have to explore around the screen and try to figure out how to make those particular pieces work. Question has been around for a number of years. I share this usually when I'm working with uh, English language arts and science. And same thing, no instructions. Now, most educators, that drives them absolutely crazy. The kids love it because there's no rules, really. They start clicking on things. And if you look at that, you go, where do I even start? And there is a little thing at the very beginning that it says, okay, you're going to have to go to uh, 80 different levels. It asks you a series of questions. But you have to solve a whole bunch of problems. And it's a very, very safe environment to fail in. And this works really well in groups of two or three with kids. I did a workshop uh, in Denton, Texas here last year. I could not, on a Saturday, no less, I could not get the kids to go to lunch. I could not get them to go home because they wanted to keep playing this particular question on game. comes from United Kingdom from a group there. Uh, this is the new thing that uh, Tony Wagner shared with me, a new model that he has in his book called The Three Ps on play, passion, and purpose. And one of those things is curiosity. And I have uh, uh, six grandkids, 
And the five-year-old, the seven-year-old, and the nine-year-old. Uh, Brock is nine, Ava is seven, and Luca is five, soon to start kindergarten. It is absolutely amazing when they come over to our house because uh, we have, as you can see, there are a bunch of two-by-fours. Of what those kids will do in playing and putting the pieces together of trying to build something. And we've got huge boxes of Legos. And they will play literally for hours. And I've often thought, uh, I met with Mitchell Resnick uh, a few years ago uh, from MIT, and I said, how do we bring that back into the classroom? And he said, well, the problem is we do it in kindergarten, and then, uh, you know, first grade changes all that. And I think he's exactly right. If we can bring that curiosity back, and this is what uh, uh, Michael shared with me about the process that the students go through, <laughs> that they imagine it and how they create it, they play, they share with their friends, and they think about it, and then they repeat that whole process and go through that, how we can bring that, how we should bring that back into our curriculum. So this was uh, an article that I came across about a month ago, and it talks about using their imagination. It was in uh, Teacher Magazine in The Guardian, and it's a really excellent article about what we can do in our classrooms for those kind of things. And here's some examples that I took from the article, and the link is directly on that other slide so you can pull that piece together and how to do things different. You know, what if a landowner during the Civil War lived in the North and had slaves? What would have happened there? Having a discussion, you have this as small group discussions and then report back, or you can do it as a large group discussion. So there are several that came from the article that uh, were put together on that. Plain history, uh, again, and, and a lot of my things, I usually get asked, well, where do you come up with all this stuff? I spend two or three hours a day kind of researching but I have an awful lot of people uh, on Twitter, uh, about four, about close to 5,000 now, that send me things every day, and I research those, and then if they, I think they're really beneficial for classroom, for things that we're doing, I add them to it. And this is one, to play history. You take on a role, and it's not just American history. It's uh, worldwide history, British history, any number of those, and the link is there for you to actually be able to play history. Flight to Freedom, where it's a role-playing game, where you take on the role of a slave. What was it like? What would happen if? So very creative. And again, back to a safe place to fail, that we can put all those pieces together in there and have a safe environment for the kids to learn from that experience. And then the last one was on here, taking historical events and doing a simulation and going through that, making decisions as a group, a uh, small group or as a class if you want to, divide them into the smaller groups. So, Annie, this is uh, back to you, although I see Steve came in. Maybe we'll, we'll select Steve. Steve, are you there okay? I think Steve Not might be with, a, with another speaker right now. Okay. Okay. That's okay. Sorry. Amy, I'll use you. <laughs> here's, here's what's going to happen, Amy. You're going to see a photograph, and normally what we do is we bring three to four people to the front of the room, and then you see a photograph. And you have to tell us what's going on in this photo. Explain to us for 30 seconds. So, Amy, here is your photo. Tell us what's going on in this particular situation. All right, so this girl um, is in a new place. She's traveling, and she has lost her traveling um, partner. And this gentleman is trying to calm her down and reassure her that it's going to be OK, and she's, uh, she's in the right place, and that he's got a phone, and he's going to be able to, to call, to call uh, her friend or the authorities or whatever and reconnect her with her traveling partner. And it's going to be OK, and she's going to be safe. Um, and yeah, I really okay. like that's, he's that's saying, good. you hit my car. Awesome. <laughs> Well, and then the way that this would work in the classroom is you, you just find a bunch of photos. These happen to be some that I took in Italy. Then we have two or three people, and the next person can either continue your story or do a new one. Now, the real story is, notice the giveaway is what she has in her hand. A lot of people don't catch that. That's a handkerchief. She is crying. He is trying to calm her down. The reason that she is crying is she just found out. Now, by the way, they're engaged. She just found out that he slept with her sister. Real story. So it was really, really touchy. I was shooting this from a telephone lens a long ways back. I didn't want to be too, too close on it. Here's another one that you can do. We're not going to do it, but just here's another one. So you tell the story about that. 
things that you can do within a minute or two and just put the things together to tell a story. So I then uh, want to move in and then we'll, uh, we'll leave uh, a few minutes here for questions at the end. And I won't get to all the slides, but you can go through it. It's on creative writing. And this is probably one of the most creative things that I've done and come across. And again, uh, someone sent me this on Twitter, and they said, have you seen the Scholastic, the, uh, the, the story piece? And what you do is that little spin, it gives you four different scenarios. And it says, uh, you have to do this, make up a joke about, and then something would come up in that window, that window, that window. And then you have to make up a story, again, standing in front of the group. You give them 30 seconds to think about that. Or if you want to do the writing piece, you actually have them go write the pieces and put that and turn it in and then stand up and do a podcast or make a video of them if you want to. So great way to do that. Um, this is called Storybird. And it's another way that you can publish. I feel real strong about that, that uh, when students are published, it's extremely powerful. Um, this was free. They're now starting to charge if you want to print it as a PDF. You can still do it online. It's free. But if you want to print it, they charge you for the PDF. So there is a small charge for that. Zooverse is free, done in a number of different languages, as you can see on here. And it's a pop-up book. And there are 12 pages that you can put in there, and you tell a story. Very simple, you use storyboard, you put uh, uh, cards together, put that story, tell it together, do the creative writing piece. Now, uh, under the uh, language arts piece, this is a program that I was not aware of until about uh, two weeks ago. And you get six pages, and it's a picture book maker. And you can actually animate the things in here. It is free. I wouldn't be surprised at some point in time in the next year that it goes for pay for play. But right now, you put the animal that's into it, you put simple text that's on it, you put it together. Here's a screenshot of what it looks like in all the different pieces. You pull it up, you animate it, the draft can go down, it can eat something off the tree, you can string rope around, you tell the story, put the pages in there. I had way too much fun with this program. So the creative writing piece, we bring all of the writing piece, the creativity piece, putting all of those pieces together on that. This comes from uh, United Kingdom. This is called Boom Writer. And again, it's another way to get published where you can put those out there. It is uh, done in the United Kingdom, but you can get if you're a classroom teacher and educator, you can get that. Uh, NPR Radio has had this out for a number of years. And uh, what I really like about it is you can actually publish these by sending them to them, but you have to t tell a three to five minute story or write a 500 word story that's published on the web or sent into them. And if you have an intro web where they can, parents can read it. But the catch is that there have usually two situations. So this is the one from about two months ago. It says, in your story, one of the characters has to tell a joke. One of the characters has to cry. So you put all those different pieces together on it, and you tell your story. And every month, they change that. You can go on there, and the link is directly for that. So I'm going to do the last one here on creative problem solving. Um, and this kind of goes along with the failure piece that you can try in a number of different things. Marty Pfluger wrote this book, and he did two of them, and, he, and they're, they're now out of print. So you have to order them from somebody that has it as a used book. And I uh, asked Amy ahead if she would do this. There are over 250 different ideas in this book, and there's brainstorming and brainstorming too. So, Amy, we're going to start with this, and we'll go back and forth. And the question is, where in the world would you find a leaf or leaves? Amy, you're first. Um, in a rain gutter. Okay, on the ground. Your turn. On the on the side of the road. That's sort of a, a sort of cheap. <laughs> okay, I'm going to throw you a loop. On a jersey, and then you tell me what I'm talking about. On a jersey cow. Oh, hey, you're good, Amy. I wasn't thinking of that. I was thinking of a sports jersey. Okay, okay. What, 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 the Canadians? Exactly, Canadian maple leaves. Got okay, it. Your turn. Um, in the trees. Okay, now, Amy's grabbing like most students do, like, oh, well, I, uh, and what happens is when you do this with teachers, all of a sudden somebody throws out on a table. And kids, or they look at you like, what? On a table? 
They don't know some of the kids younger age. They don't know there's a thing in table called a table leap. So that's where you're looking for the kids hopefully to go to pull those kind of things up. Amy, one more, and then I'll show you a couple more slides and we'll wrap up. Give uses for a piece of toast, Amy. Uh, to shop up spilled milk. Okay, and in the chat box, if you've got some ideas, go ahead and put it in there. Uh, yeah, that's funny because that's what I was going to say. Use it as a sponge. Uh, I'll just throw in there for under a poached egg. Your turn? Definitely under a poached egg. That would be my favorite. <laughs> you draw a blank? It's okay. I am drawing a blank. Well, and the I'm idea of this is to go around the class. And again, I've talked to teachers that have eliminated tardy problems because this is what happens. There's over 250 in the book. This is what happens when that tardy bell rings. They make sure that they're in their seat to be able to try to figure some of these things out. Another one, uh, we don't have time to do, but I'll give it to you. Kid uses for a windshield wiper. Now, they go from very, very simple to complex. Uh, Brangle is a great website for brain teasers and riddles to put the pieces together, do some big creativity things. And then the last one I'm going to show you here, uh, and I'll turn it back to Amy for any questions. Uh, as we wrap up, and this happens to do with creativity, I'm going to jump through uh, a few of these slides because I do want to just show these. This is uh, determining between fact or opinion, and what you do is you have a discussion that's like, my dad is taller than your dad. Well, is that fact or opinion? My mom is the best mom. Is that fact or opinion? Then you have discussion. You've gone through critical thinking skills. This is one of the best sites around to actually check out conspiracy theories. Smithsonian has done this. They have one about UFOs in Roswell. They have one uh, that's on uh, Amelia Earhart. There's one about the Apollo moon landing, claiming that it never happened, and the attack on Pearl Harbor. So, Amy, I'm going to, I don't know if I need to jump ahead on this. Um, and then the last one that's on here is who fired the first shot. And this happens to be Smithsonian and the fact or fiction piece. So, I, this is what I started with. This is what I will end with. And each of you that are out there, you are just one person, but you can take these things back, again, under Creative Commons, and you can share those. If you need to download the PowerPoint or PDF, they are there right now, drhowie.com. And the Disney Science website, you can go to officially. We're going to launch that in September. Lots of ideas on creativity with Imagineers and authors that I'm looking at, lots of resources. So it is not official, but it's out there, and we're, it's still a work in progress. So, Amy, I know we went a couple minutes over, but I'm going to throw it back to you. Thank you so much, Howie. This has been great. And you know what? I'm going to give you a few more minutes. If you want to take some questions from the chat, go ahead. Um, I need to get started on another session, so I'll be right back in like two minutes. But go ahead and okay. take questions from the chat. If you guys have uh, questions, go ahead and type it in there. I am watching. I don't see anybody. I don't know if people are typing. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about the Disney Science one. It's, it's basically, um, we have permission to use Disney Science. You can imagine trying to get Disney things. But we have videos we've shared on there. Um, there's a series of books that Jeff Dixon, who I met uh, two years ago, um, the uh, pieces that he writes is called Historical Fiction. It's actual takes place in the parks. And uh, as you go through, if you've ever been to the park, you're always, well, I wonder if that's there. I wonder if that's there. Um, Let's see, what's a CB, uh, CBK Associates? Uh, let's see, I'm, trying to, I'm looking here. Um, all right, what do you think about service learning combining with project-based learning? Um, you know, I think, here's my concern. Um, I have enough trouble getting people to, and I'm gonna, I shouldn't say it this way, but buy into STEM. STEAM and project-based learning, I think it's a great idea, but I need to take them in baby steps. And one of the things I did at Q this year was five easy projects, and, and it's also on my website if you want to download it, five easy projects to get started with project-based learning and STEM. I think we need to take the baby steps and get them going, and I think that's a great way so that we end up uh, turning it into, and, and Blue Valley School District does this, and turning that into a semester-long project uh, that we do in doing project-based learning, acquired-based learning, and bringing the service learning piece into it. So I'm, I'm, I fully uh, agree with it. I just want to make sure we don't jump too far too fast. 
So there is that one, and um, let's see. Acquired based learning, super industrial public ed is making it happen. Um, I guess my answer to that is I uh, retired six years ago and I stay very busy. I usually travel a week and I'm home a week. When I'm home, I do video conferencing. And I video conference in the school districts for the professional learning services. And we do a lot of workshops. And in the last year and a half, things have really ticked up. A lot more people are really interested in, uh, in learning um, about, you know, what's it all about? Well, how do I do this? And again, as I said, I start very small and we work up into it. So um, it, it's starting to change, I think, with the economy and uh, what has happened with the recession and all those people are looking for different things and preparing kids. Uh, no matter if you agree or disagree on Common Core, I personally think it's a good thing. Um, I don't, I'm not really excited about the whole assessment piece, but I think Common Core has got standards in all of the states, and there are a few that are still not in there. I think that gives us something to rally around, and I have a whole session uh, that if you want on my website on uh, Common Core, we did one last Saturday. You can download that on Common Core. Uh, and also I did one at FETC if you're interested in Common Core on the website. Um, there's 350 slides there on Common Core and content areas. So it looks like Amy's back. We've answered a few questions that we had. Uh, Amy, I apologize. I don't know. Is somebody else using this room? So do we need to jump out of here? Nope. You're good. This room is all yours. So don't worry. I'm, okay. I'm really glad that people had questions. This has been a great session. Thank you so much. Okay, I don't see any's. Okay, thank All you. Right. Awesome. Well, that's great. That's great. Thank to you see again. That. I'm going to so, go ahead and stop the recording. And thanks again, Howie. Thank you very much. Everybody have a great day.